Thanks very much, all of you, for coming today. I'm Teresa Marks. I'm the Chief Deputy Director here at the Department of Pesticide Regulation. Um, and we really appreciate your taking the time to give up your lunch hour and come. This is a very important topic, and we're happy to present it. Uh, we're very pleased to have Joel Bittner, the General Manager of Placer Mosquito and Vector Control District, talk with us today about this county's innovative approach to controlling pests that are not only irritating, but at times they can cause serious public health concerns. Um, they use uh, several tools to do this, and he's going to talk about that. Uh, they use the concept of integrated vector management. And I know a lot of us have heard integrated pest management for some time, but integrated vector management is not quite the same thing, and I look forward, as I know you do, to him further explaining what that is. It is a science-based decision-making process. We know that it's focused on protecting public health, and it's achieved through management of vector populations, interrupting the transmission of vector-borne pathogens, and the use of environmentally sound methods in achieving those goals. So for the sake of time, if you wouldn't mind, please hold your questions until the end of the presentation. Now, if you'll please join me in welcoming Joel Bettner. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, being here today. Um, I think our, uh, uh, you know, we, we both uh, deal with uh, pesticides and pests and, and uh, trying to do a good job in those areas. So it's, a, it's an honor for me to share how we deal with it on the public health side. Um, so I will start. Um, Start now. So as Teresa, Teresa mentioned, I am the general manager of the Placer Mosquito and Vector Control District. Um, uh, I cover Placer County, which is just north and east of here, um, all the way from the edge of Sacramento to Lake Tahoe. Uh, so we have a very diverse uh, environment. And um, we, have, um, we have an example of pretty much all the different environments that you, you come across in California. So I think throughout this talk, I'd like you to you know, we can extend some of these concepts to, to statewide issues, although I will be kind of speaking mostly from a Placer County perspective. Um, our mission is to effectively and efficiently manage the risks of vectors and vector-borne disease in order to protect public health and the quality of life in Placer County. So it should be easy, right? Um, in the greater context, uh, we are uh, part of a community of districts throughout the state. Um, these are the members of our state association, the Mosquito and Vector Control Association of California. They represent pretty much all of the districts. There are maybe 10 or 12 smaller uh, entities that aren't um, in this group. But it gives, this map gives you a bit of an uh, idea of how we're distributed in terms of agencies like mine providing a protection to the public health from vectors and vector-borne disease. There are some gaps, and uh, those gaps are covered by the De California Department of Public Health. So we work very closely with uh, the California Department of Public Health, industry, and the University of California. So um, all of us together are really um, important in making sure that we are providing the best uh, possible service, and we keep uh, on top of any new and emerging issues that, that arise, which I'll be talking about quite a bit. All right. So for those of you who don't know, um, uh, agencies such as mine, uh, we are a California special district. This is a particular uh, form of a local government agency. So when you hear that, you know, Placer Mosquito and Vector Control District, we are not part of the county of Placer, but our, uh, our uh, jurisdiction is over the the area that is Placer County. Um, we're, uh, our enabling legislation is a California Health and Safety Code, uh, the part, part that's called the Mosquito Abatement Law. And that uh, dictates how we're governed, um, that we have uh, local trustees that are appointed from the municipalities and the county governments that sit on our boards. Um, so th those folks in Placer County, there's seven of them, and they're my boss. Um, and then uh, we also have a cooperative agreement with the California Department of Public Health. So this is very important and maybe a little bit different than what CDPR folks are used to is that we are uh, pesticide applicators, but rather than falling under the CDPR uh, regime, we have kind of this separate uh, regulation under the mosquito abatement law that allows the Department of Public Health to certify and train our applicators to provide uh, public health pesticide applications. So we'll get into how that kind of works a little bit uh, later. Um, on that note, though, as a, as a local agency, uh, my staff apply pesticides. We still work with the county 
ag commissioner. We do the reporting. It comes back through the CDPR system kind of on the back end. Um, so we you know, kind of work in parallel a little bit. Um, other ways we kind of interact with um, you know, your, your kind of structure is uh, when we hire out ag applicators. So later on in the talk, we'll talk about our use of aerial applications. So we'll hire out uh, an aerial contractor, which is then regulated under CDPR, QALs, and uh, Section K, and all of that sort of thing. And then um, we have a kind of a close, close relationship in that. Okay. okay, this is Placer County to give you an idea. And if you uh, look kind of where it says Auburn and a little bit to the left and down uh, west on I-80, there's a little area um, called Penryn. And that was really, really important um, back a little about, a little over 100 years ago uh, because that was the, the birthplace of the first organized anti-malarial campaign in the United States. So it was the second reg, uh, kind of official mosquito control program. The first was over on the coast uh, dealing with salt marsh mosquitoes that were uh, a very big uh, nuisance. I mean, to the extent where it's not just a few. It was you can't go outside. Um, so that started it. But it quickly moved into the Penryn area where malaria was abundant around the turn of the 1900s. And um, uh, to the extent where the colony of Loomis, which is now the town of Loomis, uh, basically picked up stakes and, and gave up. They said, you know, public health, we're getting sick. You know, you got the chills. Uh, it's horrible. We're, we're out of here. Um, it only, it took this gentleman and, and some of his uh, um, colleagues. Uh, this is Dr. Uh, William Herms from the uh, University of California, Berkeley. At that time, who came in and basically pioneered what we do today. Uh, which is doing some surveillance, figuring out what sorts of mosquitoes are where, what sorts of habitats do they like, um, what sort of uh, level of disease um, are they carrying, what's the risk to public health, and then coming up with um, what is now our integrated vector management control methods, uh, which I'll get into later. So this word vector. <laughs> <laughs> this one always uh, confuses people, so I, I like to put this out right at the beginning. So from a biological standpoint, a, a vector is an animal or an organism that can carry a pathogen and transmit it to another organism. In, uh, in the law, in California law, we like to adjust, um, uh, adjust definitions sometimes, so they've added also capable of producing human discomfort or injury. So pictured here is in Placer County are the three vectors that we primarily um, address. And today we'll, we'll mainly be talking about mosquitoes, but we do deal with ticks and uh, the, the diseases ticks carry, Lyme disease and others, um, and then yellow jackets, which tend to be a really big pest. Um, if you visited Lake Tahoe this summer, um, you might have some experience with that. It was record numbers and we got lots of service calls and uh, we had to go up there and, and handle some yellow jacket nests. Um, <clears throat> but we'll focus on, uh, on mosquitoes today. Okay, so without, I mean, I could give another whole hour talk just on this next section, so I'm going to go really fast. And what I'd like you to get out of it is, those of you who aren't familiar with mosquitoes, is that there are a lot of them. And there are a lot of different species, and there are a lot of different life histories and ecology that go along with each of those species. And that's very important, because when you're trying to, to control them or uh, in, um, impede their life cycle, you need to know all of that. So in California, there's about 50 species. In Placer County, we have 30 of them. And there's about 1,500 or so worldwide. Um, most of these, uh, I would say, are not an immediate public health threat, but as a, uh, uh, a leading um, uh, figure in, in mosquito research, Dr. Bill Risen, he's told me many times, all mosquitoes have the potential of carrying a disease. If it's, they take blood meals, the female takes blood meals from something and then bites something else, there is always that potential. So it's our job to kind of prioritize which ones are an immediate threat, which ones could be a threat in the future, which ones maybe aren't, aren't so much. And that is a big, uh, big deal. To do that, we need to understand what we're dealing with. So I'm gonna go fast. First, first section, we have the 80s mosquitoes. This, uh, in Placer County and um, in Sacramento as well, we have tree hole mosquitoes. These are container breeding mosquitoes that like to lay their eggs uh, in little K2 
containers of water, they exit here to the side of the container, and then they sit there until they get reflooded. Um, so they're like these little lurking uh, time bombs of mosquitoes that can last for many months or sometimes years. All right. Over on the right-hand side of the screen, you see all of the various species, and I won't go into each one of those. Um, but down at the bottom, this is really important. I know this will head off some questions that we have at the end. The bottom two in red, 80s Aegypti and 80s Albopictus, are the two that aren't in Calif are not in Placer County yet, but uh, were introduced in California around 2011. These are the invasive 80s mosquitoes, and these are the vectors of Zika and chikungunya and dengue and other diseases that we're not too worried about right now in terms of getting something, but we are worried that they may spread to other areas, and uh, we'll address that later in the talk. Okay, this is the Anopheles mosquitoes. This one in particular, Anopheles freeborni, is the one that uh, Dr. Herms back in 1910 um, was mainly worried about because this is the malaria vector. This one um, is still very abundant in this area, and the only reason we're not super worried about is that we don't have malaria. Uh, so in this case, the disease went away, uh, but the vector still remains, so the potential for that circulation still exists. Now, we have a pretty good uh, health care system, so if you go off to you know, Costa Rica or, uh, you know, Southeast Asia or something, you come back with malaria, the likelihood of you tromping around in rice fields and getting bit by mosquitoes for it to circulate is very low. You're going to be at home. You're going to be in the hospital. Uh, so we limit the public health risk in that way. But the vector still exists, so the potential is still there. Chilocita mosquitoes, these are the big ones that you'll see, if not now, pretty soon, flying around. They're kind of like big, huge uh, bird-like mosquitoes that uh, bite people but are not terribly uh, dangerous in terms of public health um, as far as we know right now. QX mosquitoes, these are the West Nile vector. These are the biggest public health threat from mosquitoes um, in this area and in California um, in a very big way. QX tarsalis in particular, the one that's pictured, um, likes to come out of the rice fields, irrigated agriculture, even swimming pools and, uh, you know, sources right next to your house. And this is our biggest target um, in order to uh, protect public health. Um, there's also another one, Culex pipiens or Culex quinquefasciatus, if you go down south. Um, they like to live right next to houses. They're peridomestic. They like to live right where you live. Um, and these are, uh, these are our top priorities. They're also secondary vectors. These mean that they, are, um, they have the capability of carrying West Nile, but we don't typically see them transmitting it to a person or another bird or things like that, okay? So I don't expect everyone to be now mosquito experts, uh, but it gives you an idea of kind of the breadth of what we're working with. So we need to, and we have specialists on staff in my district and others that um, understand all these things and help us um, make educated and scientifically based control decisions um, in order to best protect public health. And that's what integrated vector management is all about. Um, so to Teresa did a very nice job of kind of giving you that definition up front. Um, but over on the right, the little uh, infographic gives you kind of a, an idea of the various components. So up at the top, you have vector surveillance and disease surveillance. This is when we're actually going out in the field, collecting mosquitoes, both immature and adult. And then we're taking it back to the lab and essentially grinding them up and seeing if there's virus in them. Um, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but basically that's the idea. Um, and depending on how many we catch and how many of those are infected, we have a pretty good idea of what the risk of uh, the, the people that are standing out there, living out there, working out there has in terms of potentially getting, uh, getting a disease. And that's what we use as our primary driver in um, understanding what our um, uh, implementing our, our control methods, which are down at the bottom. And I'll get way more into this also. Um, so, um, since West Nile came into California in 2004, uh, the left and the right side of this infographic really became more of an issue. So public outreach, community partnerships, understanding um, how to communicate what we do to the community and engaging them in helping us help them. So this goes everything from you know, dump and drain campaigns, which I'm sure you've heard, you know, dump out your, your standing water, this sort of thing, wear repellent, you know, long sleeves, you know, be careful around dawn and dusk. 
Hopefully all of us has heard, have heard these things. Well, that wasn't always the case. Um, so we've done a lot of work to, to educate folks. Um, as we move forward and we handle new threats in uh, mosquitoes and vector control, some of those some of those messages may change a little bit. And uh, we're, we try as an industry to try to get the public educated enough so that they can be able to internalize those and really help, help themselves um, as well as us helping them. Quality control and research is the last one is they're really, we are a small community um, and a lot of research and advances in pesticide applications, let's say, for example, in ag, some have some crossover with public health, some are completely different. Um, so we have to generate kind of our own capability to uh, push some of these techniques forward. Um, and we're doing that both at the state and national level and also at, at our own districts. Okay. So I'm gonna move into um, how we implement integrated vector management. And I'm gonna start by talking about West Nile because again, we're looking for the best way, the most effective way to protect public health. Um, and that's the biggest issue we have uh, in California. Um, it's not Zika, it's West Nile <laughs> um, still. So over on the left, you have mosquito life cycle. Um, this, all mosquitoes need water uh, to develop in. There are no, you know, mosquitoes don't hang out in bushes or grass. They need water at some point in their life cycle. And it's that point between eggs and they emerge as adults. They need to be wet. Um, so that is uh, a very good place for us to uh, basically interrupt their life cycle. So that's the focus on standing water. So again, some like those tree holes, those temporary sources, some like uh, extremely small areas like, you know, like uh, pooled water on a piece of garbage under the, under the backyard. That would be like one of these uh, invasive mosquitoes, these 80s. Some like rice fields, some like uh, cleaner water, some like dirtier water but it all depends based on the species. Um, in, the Culex, in the Culex mosquitoes, the West Nile vector, um, the adults emerge out of the water and they, uh, the females will fly and try to find a bird. These Culex species are bird feeding mosquitoes. So again, they're specific to the, that, that species. Um, there's good and a bad side of that. The good side is that a lot of people don't notice them. Uh, they're not coming out and attacking you um, as humans. But the bad part is they pick up bird diseases like West Nile virus. So the, the wild bird population uh, basically is the reservoir for West Nile. Um, in the summertime, it, the heat, uh, as its temperatures go up. That virus replicates in the wild bird population. The mosquitoes pick it up. And then they go be bite something else. Um, it could be other birds that spreads it uh, throughout space. So one bird to another bird to another bird. Now we have it everywhere. Now those mosquitoes bite the birds and then they can bite what are called dead end hosts, humans, horses, and other things. Um, and that's down at the bottom, okay? The good thing about West Nile, and maybe the only good thing is that if you have West Nile and you get bitten by a mosquito, you're not gonna pass it to the mosquito. So it doesn't transmit via person to person via mosquito, okay? And it has to go through that bird. That's probably why we don't see as much spread of that disease as other vector-borne diseases like, you know, that in other parts of the world, like malaria or dengue fever or even Zika, which are spread from one person to a mosquito bite to another person. Okay, so again, every mosquito is different, every disease cycle is different. We need to understand how that works in order to break that up and provide some control. Okay, let's let you pause on that for a moment. Because the next one is really how do we start this whole process? And it's, again, going out into the public and going out to groups such as yourself and increase the awareness of this. One is just very basically that we're here and this is what we do. And, uh, you know, we, we don't, you know, we're not... We're not a lot of things that people think we are. We don't just go out and spray things. We don't just, you know, take bulldozers and, you know, pave wetlands. We do actually a lot of science, and a lot of what we do is based on that science, and it's uh, focused on protecting public health. Okay. We also prevent mosquitoes. I think, um, you know, my background, I have a master's in uh, IPM from Davis, and I've worked in a lot of you know, uh, herbicide-related uh, issues, aquatic, um, aquatic weeds, and, and, and other fields. 
um, mosquito control and public health is really the one field that I have seen that incorporates all the components of IPM all together. And prevention is a really big one. If you can get rid of the problem before it's a problem, then you don't have to spray it, right? So um, we do a lot of that in, in public health. And um, I, I joke with my staff, it's like if we do a perfect job, then no one knows we're around because there isn't a problem. Um, and that's a good and a bad thing. Um, but source reduction, dumping and draining, ecological management, which is basically dump and drain on a larger scale. Uh, in the picture, this is uh, um, some staff uh, draining a beaver dam or notching a beaver dam or installing a, a device to basically retain the water for the beavers, but let excess water pass through so that we don't have this flooding buildup, which sparks tremendous amounts of mosquitoes. Um, that by doing physical control methods, uh, we don't have to treat it, which is cheaper, which is better for the environment, which is better for resistance management. And we do all, all uh, these things quite a bit where we can. Um, last year, we were actually up in um, Lake Tahoe, and uh, there was a campground that regularly got flooded. Now, the mosquito up there is a snowmelt mosquito. We don't have a lot of West Nile, but still, it was, uh, it was a nuisance. And we were able to basically kill two birds with one stone and uh, install one of these, uh, it's called a Clemson Pond Leveler, a very temporary structure that, you know, basically you lay in the creek bed and the beavers are happy, the, the water goes downstream, and, um, you know, we're even able to remove it in the wintertime um, so it doesn't get washed away. Um, it worked really well. So we really strive to do things like that. Um, unfortunately, we can't do that everywhere. It only works in those places, but we, we, um, that's something that's a... Uh, um, it's a big success when we can identify those. Biological control is another one. Um, over the years, there have been many, many different types of biological control agents that have been tried from fungus to different fish, native fish, so forth. Uh, really, the only one that works on any reasonable scale is Gambusia finis, or the mosquito fish. Um, at our facility, we have a, a tank-based breeding program. So we breed about 100 pounds, so it's uh, 100 pounds at about 450 fish a pound. So that's a lot. <laughs> and uh, we put them out um, in a very similar manner that we would, say, put out a larvicide uh, pesticide. We apply a mosquito fish treatment to certain sources. And um, the, our number one source for mosquito fish is unmaintained swimming pools. It's a perfect, um, a perfect uh, habitat for the fish. Uh, it's a horrible habitat in terms of mosquitoes. So you put those fish in there, and uh, they can do a lot to prevent mosquitoes. There was actually some new research that I learned about um, a little bit more this past uh, week where um, some researchers are, are finding that chemicals that the, the fish actually produce um, are repellent, create the water repellency in the water so the mosquito, the, the adult mosquitoes don't even want to land there. So not only do they eat the mosquitoes, they're, they're kind of keeping the adults away. So that's, that's a really interesting direction that um, definitely warrants some more research. Okay, okay so we're, we've prevented things. You know, we've, we've eliminated, we've prevented the mosquitoes to the best of our ability. There's still going to be, we can't get rid of all the water. There's always going to be those sources that do produce mosquitoes. They do go through that life cycle, and we're going to have to manage the population. Okay? And that's where we get into our larvicides and adulticides. Um, in speaking with some of you and Paul and others, um, you know, our, te our terminology might be slightly different, so I'm going to be as clear as I can. Our larvicides are materials that target mosquito larvae or the Im immature phase, uh, stages of, of mosquitoes. Um, within those, we have about four different categories. We have the biorationals. These are typically bacterial origin uh, materials. So they're either the bacteria or the toxins that the bacteria produce that are then formulated into something that are very specific to mosquitoes. Um, we have growth regulators, um, surface films, and then oils. So these are the different types of tools that we have to use depending on when one of my technicians come up to a standing water source, they dip some mos uh, mosquito larvae and they say, okay, we think this is probably this species. Uh, we think this is, you know, we can see that they're, um, you know, they're very small larvae uh, or they're very big larvae or they're pupae. They have to make a decision on which one of these products to use based on our, our, our protocols. 
Okay. On the other side, we have adulticides, which are focused towards the, the adult mosquitoes. These are the ones, typically, that there's too many of them, and they're going to get um, infected with something that are then going to spread to people, or they're already infected with something like West Nile and are going to spread them to people, and we need to get rid of them quickly, and typically in a pretty focused area. So if we do a good job of surveillance, and we can say, OK, it's just this area that we're concerned about and not this area, we can go treat this area. If it takes a long time or um, you know, some of the methods are, are delayed in the results, then we end up with areas like this. And we don't want to do that. So when, we, when you hear during the summertime um, you know, mosquitoes spraying again or they're, you know, all these sorts of things, this is where most of our press comes from. And really, it is, um, it is one situation that we're addressing with one particular tool um, to reduce uh, transmission risk of a disease to people. And we'll get more into those application methods and chemistries as well. I'm going to kind of move this along a little bit. OK. So finally, just to wrap up integrated vector management, um, this is kind of a review of what I just said. So over on the right-hand side, you have the, the pyramid with source reduction as our most preferred method, followed by biological control, larvicides, and adulticides. So source reduction, the green, affects those life stages of the mosquito. We can block those. No, there is no problem. We've prevented it. Biological control, our fish kind of work in that arena right there. Okay? But if you have you know, uh, sources with eggs or you have a bunch of adults coming out, fish aren't going to do anything. Okay? And adulticides, obviously, are attacking the ad adults, but aren't doing anything for the larvae. So it's a multi-pronged approach that we need to um, take into account. Now, as I get into some of these examples, um, also bear in mind here that it's not, we see one cycle. But most of these mosquitoes, especially the ones that are vectors of West Nile, aren't, it's not just you know, one cohort of female mosquitoes laying their eggs, going through their life cycle once, and then they're done. If it was like that, it would make my job a whole heck of a lot easier. There are some emerging at some points and starting their life cycle. There's others coming over here. So at any given time, you have multiple generations and multiple life stages, even in the same, say, rice field or same pond or same swimming pool. On top of that, you can have intermingled species as well. So it gets very complex very quickly. OK. And finally here, uh, just uh, to reinforce what I said, down at the bottom, we can prevent the problem. Once we get up to the top, we need to respond. And during the summer, right around July to August, it switches. For every district in the state, we're on prevention mode. And then, oops, we have West Nile, and we're switching over to responding and trying to limit um, spread of the disease. Okay? And that's about when you start seeing uh, newspaper articles and, and news reports. OK. I talked about action thresholds a little bit. I'm going to move on, and I'll come back to this in a little bit. OK. In the field, um, we are, uh, Placer and, and, and a few other districts are really working on how do we get all of this multitude of surveillance data and um, you know, where the West Nile is and how many mosquitoes are where and distill that down into kind of a digestible unit that someone in the, at the field level can use. Because really when you have, um, I have, a, I have a, a, a zone, an area in my district that has, you know, say 12,000 sources. 12,000 spots that have standing water that we know may or may have not produced mosquitoes in the past. How does this person know which ones to go to first? You know, is it different in May than it is in August? And it is. Um, and, you know, where have I been? What do I do? Where were the treatments? Um, so we're trying to develop a uh, data management system um, that kind of focuses on this dashboard concept to help them in real time give them some tools on how to make some of these decisions at the ground level. So this is just an example. This is our whole district as of um, this morning. <laughs> all of our, all of our, uh, uh, our um, surveillance data. So on the far right, you see uh, 2016. So that's this year and 2015 and 14 to the left. The top row is all the species and their abundance. So we have about 50 plus weekly traps that 
are in the same spot and we go out every week and collect and count and identify all the mosquitoes and that gets recorded here. Um, the middle row is the West Nile uh, virus positive mosquito samples. Pools mean samples of mosquitoes that are tested for presence of West Nile. And that gives us the black line is kind of the year to date. So if you look far to the right, um, that says 103. So we had 103 positive pools this year as opposed to 51 last year. So at a glance, it gives you an idea. People say, was this a bad year? Yeah, this was a bad year. If you go back to 2012, which was the um, last bad year, um, I'll show you in a, a little later um, what that looked like in terms of risk to human health. Down at the bottom is the weather. The blue lines are rainfall, and the green line is average temperature. And this is something we're playing with. This is just, for one, this is just recording from one site um, at the Lincoln Airport. But um, we think this is a very important metric to basically compare against the other two to see if we can make good decisions or better decisions or more specific decisions about mosquito control. Okay. In the field, our techs can drill down to whatever um, geographic area or set of traps that they want. <clears throat> Excuse me. And this is just another, another view of, a, of basically Roseville. Okay. So this is, this is kind of brand new stuff. We're going to be deploying this into the field for next season. We're beta testing it right now, and uh, we'll be adding functionality to it as, we, as time goes on. Okay, I'm going to just kind of shift gears and get back into the, into the products that we use. Um, uh, recall I was talking about mosquito larvicides. Um, we have within mosquito larvicides, we talk about uh, the biorationals, and there's just some specific examples I'd like to discuss. One is um, BTI, Bacillus th uh, thuringiensis israeliensis. Um, this is a liquid in a granule. This is basically a variety of soil bacteria that is basically um, grown up, fermented, you know, grown in a tank, and the toxin, which is a combination of four different um, active ingredients um, is then applied. So this is uh, the nice thing about this material is that it is specific to uh, the family of flies, the diptera of which mosquitoes are a part. And um, you know they eat it. It finds particular uh, specific active sites in their midgut. It creates a pore. It makes them leak. It gets nasty and it kills them. Um, so that's really nice. We have basically a. a a biorational product that's chemically specific to our pest. So that is great. We use it a lot. It's got four different components, so resistance is uh, less of an issue. Um, and we use it extensively throughout the state. Um, this is what goes on rice fields, and uh, there's organic uh, varieties of BTI formulation. There's um, not organic versions of BTI um, that we use uh, pretty widely. Um, Bacillus spiricus is very similar. It doesn't have quite as many active ingredients, and there's been some issues with, um, with resistance in uh, spiricus. Um, and then we also mix them together, and that makes them even better. So the more different actives you can put together um, helps reduce the, the, the risk of uh, resistance. Um, there's also a relatively new product in the last few years um, in mosquito control of spinosad. I know it's been available in ag for quite some time, uh, but that's a novel uh, mechanism of action, um, which is very, very nice. And that's something that we are always looking for in mosquito control, our new chemistries to come in, whether they're bio, bio, biological, biorational, or otherwise, um, so we can set up this rotation. Unlike an ag uh, system where there's pretty much whatever is available is available. We only have a really kind of a small group of public health pesticides that we're able to choose from. And sometimes that gets us, uh, there's some challenges with that. Okay. We also have insect growth regulators. Methoprene is another one. We use this one extensively, excuse me, in, um, in uh, stormwater catch basins. So, you know, we just had the rains. Um, if you go out and walk down the street, especially down here, and you look down through the grate, some of them will have water down there. Some of them won't. Um, so in the ones that have water, we will sometimes put a, um, either a spinosad or a methoprene product that's a, a slow release. And it can, it can last for a number of weeks. Um, and that basically will prevent uh, any mosquitoes that start to develop from becoming adults. It impedes their uh, ability to molt. Okay. Again, also very safe. Um, you know, people don't molt. 
So the, the chem biochemical pathways that uh, affect the mosquito uh, aren't present in a lot of our non-target um, um, species. So again, it's a, a, a relatively low risk and um, a chemically specific product, which we like. Um, the last two monomolecular films, unfortunately, uh, we don't really have one of these available anymore, uh, but basically sealed the top of the water uh, for a period of time so that the larvae can't breathe. Um, and, that, and then broke down. That was really nice. We still have some of that at our district, and we use it um, a lot in very environmentally sensitive areas because it goes out, it's, there's no toxic effect, it's a, it's a physical barrier, um, and, then it, and then it breaks down. So we use that in Tahoe actually a lot. Um, surface oils, that's another one. This is the one that Bill Herms back in 1910 used a lot, only they used things like you know, something that's close to diesel or, you know, one step away from crude oil. Basically, again, to form a, a, a barrier over the surface of the water. We don't do that anymore. Uh, we do use this in some areas where there's pupae. So if you remember that life cycle, the stage that's just before they emerge, um, they don't feed and they have a very hard, um, impenetrable, almost, um, exoskeleton. So a lot of products that either absorb or are ingested don't affect them. So the oils, the surface oils, are really the only pupicide that we have available. So depending on the circumstances, you know, that's the one we have to use. <clears throat> okay. Um, I covered most of this already, and I'm, I think I'm running a little short, so I'm going to move on. Okay. Um, the feedback I got in prep preparing this talk was um, there was a lot of questions about how do you decide when to make an application. That's a big deal in all, all, all pesticide applications. You know, you have certain triggers or thresholds that you use. It's a big concept in IPM and also in IVM. Um, so for larvicides, the most, the easiest one um, is the dip count. That's a dipper. It's about a pint cup on a stick, really high tech. And you scoop up the water, and there's an art to it, so you don't scare away all the mosquitoes. While you do it, you take a scoop. And if you see what you see on the screen here, um, that's definitely getting a treatment. That's uh, several hundred per dip. That's out of a catch basin. The little dark floating things on top are egg rafts. And then the, the slightly long, oblong things underwater, those are larvae. So that's a bad one. That's a no-brainer. That gets a treatment. Um, our, tree, our threshold in Placer, though, is one larva found in 20 dips. That's because for every larvae that, or larva that emerges as an adult, that adult will then go and lay um, several sets of two, two to 400 eggs. Um, and as the season progresses, as the summer gets warmer, that cycle speeds up. Mosquitoes basically speed up as it gets warmer. And um, now you can do the math. We've got a lot more. So um, especially in the early season, we really focus on trying to get rid of larvae because we get bigger bang for our buck, if you will, um, by preventing those later um, mosquitoes that are going to cause that exponential growth. <clears throat> Here's what treatments look like. Um, there's different products. They're labeled for different application methods. It can be everything from, uh, you know, that's an unmaintained uh, hot tub. That's getting a, a, a hand application. Uh, to the right, that's an Argo. That is a uh, amphibious um, ATV, basically, with a granular uh, blower on the back. Um, just a, um, one of the things we're looking at in terms of uh, new technologies is that Argo is great. It gets into wetlands and things, but you got to drive over everything to do it. Uh, so again, environmentally sound methods, if that was all we had at one point, uh, we are looking at new technologies like uh, unmanned um, aerial systems or drones um, that might be able to take over that. So if they can go out, detect larvae, make an application, do it without having to drive through the wetland, um, that's getting us closer to our overall mission. So those are, those are sorts of things that we're, we're looking at and trying to uh, develop um, some, uh, some capability towards. Down at the bottom, that, that was a test we did um, uh, several years ago. Uh, the, I don't know if you can see the, the, the mist, the orange mist. That's a dye, and that's a BTI application to trees. Um, so these are, this is for tree hole mosquito. So this was a mosquito that... Uh, lands in, in uh, 
creates, uh, lays their eggs in the, in the rot holes in trees that hold water. Um, so the idea was if we can get some larvicide up into those areas, it will prevent them from coming off as adults. Um, and this was a test that we did. Um, and then obviously the, we have, uh, we utilize um, pretty much standard uh, agricultural uh, aerial applications for larvicide. So this is your typical crop duster. So, you know, 50 feet or less off the deck applying uh, a product to the water. So this would be, uh, we use that extensively in our rice um, in uh, some wetland areas, things like that. So it looks just like a regular ag application. All right. Um, so we can dip for larvae and decide to do an application. But again, you can't find the larvae always. And you know that they were there after you measure the adults. And then you're like, oh, I wish we would have been there to control the larvae. Um, over many years, we've had that um, epiphany. And so with that dashboard concept is, again, especially in ag areas, it's fairly um, uh, repetitive. It's, it's the, you can see these trends year after year. So we are working on some concepts of, so we know that when the rice starts to flood, it's gonna be so many days and then we start seeing adults. Let's get some larvicide out there when we think that those adults were larvae and then see if we have less adults, okay? So it's, you know, in terms of a pure IPM or like you gotta see something and then treat it, uh, we're, we're stretching the boundaries a little bit, but it's turning out to be really effective. So when we're using materials like the bioarsenals, the risk is very low. Um, it's very specific. We're not worried about non-targets. Um, and uh, we're getting some pretty good um, efficacy. So if we can, again, if we can manage the larvae at an early stage, that means we do less adulticiding later in the summer. And that's really what we're kind of shooting for. Catch basin is another one. This year, um, I have nine field staff and we hire um, about uh, with two people in the lab and three people in the field. So I don't have a big staff, but we, we um, um, inspected 37,000 catch basins this year. And about three quarters of them were dry. It was great information. We wanna know the dry ones, but man, we don't wanna go back to the dry ones. <laughs> we wanna to go to the wet ones. Those are the ones that are creating mosquitoes. So we're working on some, some procedures just to streamline that process. So if we know something's wet, we go in there, we put in a product that will prevent mosquitoes from getting there. We're not gonna wait for them to get there and then treat them, we're gonna prevent them. And then um, again, that we're, we're kind of trading that for not having to deal with adults later on in the year, okay? <clears throat> Speaking of catch basins, uh, this is what our uh, data system looks like. Um, typically, this is a, a, an aerial photo, but it didn't show up well on the slide. But each one of those little dots or squares or icons is a catch basin. This is a central, uh, the little yellow line up in the upper left is Highway 80. This is um, kind of East uh, Roseville. Uh, Douglas Boulevard runs right through the middle. So the, gr the green ones, again, our technicians um, have been there within the last 30 days. The red ones, they haven't been there in 90 days. The orange ones have been checked once in the past two years. The black ones have been checked twice in the last two years. And the little X's have had a, a larvicide application that's expired. So it was like a 30-day treatment, and now we're past that. Again, this was a snap from last week. So this is the end of the season. If you did this in August, this would look pretty much all green because we're, we're actively managing. In the wintertime, we're not gonna treat because we don't have mosquitoes producing. Okay. So again, this, these are some things that we are able to take, you know, thousands and tens of thousands of these sorts of things, reduce it to something on a map that we can address uh, pretty quickly. Um, and, you know, some of the challenges that we're having is uh, really getting the word out to uh, the municipalities and the construction folks and the, the uh, parks and rec type folks. Um, the catch basins alongside of the street is just the tip of the iceberg. We have them in parks. Anytime you have a park with a dip, there's one of these at the bottom of it. That's for flood water, right? Um, anytime you have a, a Walmart or a Home Depot and there's planters in between the parking lots, there's one in there somewhere. And sometimes they're covered up with about that much bark 
to conceal it. Um, if there's any air connection with that standing water under there, it produces mosquitoes. And there was some very interesting work done in Southern California um, by some uh, CDPH um, uh, staff uh, some years ago where, you know, you could have a little pipe that does loop-de-loops and corners and everything from here to the other side of the room, and uh, mosquitoes will follow that path and get to the water and then find their way out. So again, it's a big problem. We want to prevent that to the extent that we can. And here's another example. Uh, mosquito con control in rice. And we're, for here, we're going to kind of talk about larvicide and then uh, move into adulticide. So here's some just basic issues with rice. So if none of you have seen a rice field before, um, it's just a big field, but it's about a foot deep in water. And uh, then it starts growing rice out of it. Um, and then it's a foot or two feet of water with a bunch of plants growing out of it. If you wanted to breed mosquitoes for a living, you would take an area and fill it with water about two feet deep and grow plants out of it. Um, and that's perfect. Um, so it produces a lot of, mos uh, a lot of uh, mosquitoes. It, all, it gives it the, the development area, so places where they can oviposit. It gives the larvae uh, shelter and calm water to develop well. Um, and then it gives the adults harborage, so when they emerge and they need to dry out for a little bit, or um, they actually will feed on plant juices. Uh, and, it, and only the females go out and actually uh, um, take a blood meal. Um, all that is right there. It's like the perfect perfect spot for them. Um, so um, at the same time, it's very hard for us to get out into a rice field. Most rice fields have a big ditch, a big borrow pit, so it's maybe a three or four foot deep ditch around the perimeter of the field. Um, you can't just go walking through there or you'll have the farmer out there with not very happy. Um, so we, we're, our experience with what happens in a rice field with respect to mosquitoes is really just the edges. So again, with some new technology like the drones, hey, if we could take something and drop it off in the middle of the rice field, collect some mosquitoes, and then go pick it up and come back, um, we might learn something new. Um, this is a problem if you go back in the literature that was discussed pretty much exactly like this in 1945. So uh, this is really, um, this has been a long time process that we're trying to, trying to move forward a little bit. Um, water management. <clears throat> Farmers don't necessarily all flood at the same time and drain their fields at the same time. If they did, we'd be really happy about that. Um, the difference between conventional and organic agriculture is very different. Um, sometimes there's water management uh, related to pesticide applications. So some, some ag chemicals, um, you put out an application, you have to hold the water for so many days before you, you switch the water out. Um, <clears throat> to the extent that we know that, we probably won't apply our own pesticides to that um, until after that, that holding period's done. Um, in organic agriculture, they don't use herbicides, for example. Uh, they use water management to do weed control. So they will flood the field, fly on the, the seed, let it sprout, drain the field, basically until the rice almost looks like it's dead, but the weeds are a little more dead than the rice, and then they'll put the water back. And the theory is the rice perks back up and the weeds die. So if you can imagine that from a mosquito standpoint, we have early flooded rice, mosquitoes going, and then all the water goes away. But it doesn't actually go away, it just goes somewhere else, and all the mosquitoes go with it. So we're, also, we're not just concerned about the field, but the, wherever the drain areas is. Um, so again, if we do an application and then they f drain it, um, that's not so good. So there's a lot of components of um, understanding the crop as well as the, um, the treatment. Okay. This is what our rice looks like, just for perspective. Uh, we run about 15,000 acres total. The red on the map to the right is organic, and the blue is conventional. And you know, the, really the issue with organic and conventional is there are products that are organic, uh, um, available for organic, uh, they tend to be much, much, much more expensive. So on a per acre basis, it's about 10 times more than a conventional application. And, and uh, the choices are more limited. So again, pesticide resistance is more of an issue um, in those areas. 
Um, we apply most of our products over 15,000 acres, not by hand, but both an airplane, um, just because of the scale. And an airplane has a hard time missing all of the, the red, you know, if they're loaded up with a blue or conventional product and vice versa, although it's not really that big of a deal if you apply a <clears throat> organic product to a conventional field, it just, it just costs more. So these are all things operationally that we deal with um, on a regular basis. Um, and that's, you know, and from a, a larvicide perspective, that's what, that's what that looks like. And again, I, I apologize, I'm running a little behind. Um, the upshot of the rice in Placer County is, is this. Um, way back before there was urban development quarter mile from rice fields, rice fields were out in the country and there weren't very many people. Therefore, the risk of human disease transmission was lower. Uh, now it's a quarter mile away. <clears throat> and I just attended a planning meeting with the city of Roseville and there's two schools and a soccer complex uh, slated to go in within half a mile of this spot. That presents a problem. <clears throat> we do a lot of mosquito uh, trapping to assess how those mosquitoes that emerge from rice fields uh, and then end up in, in um, urban areas um, move and we do virus testing as well. So we're constantly comparing what's it like out in the, the rice, what's it in, in town, how, you know, trying to figure out is, are things moving, are things changing, okay? Um, all, of this, all of this data go into a, uh, a statewide surveillance database. Uh, it's called CalServe, <clears throat> CalServe Gateway. And um, this is a report from that. And if you just look briefly, the red line is this past year's uh, Culex tarsalis abundance. And between those green lines, which is roughly the end of June to the end of August, um, that was the peak. So that was the most number of um, Culex tarsalis out in the environment flying around um, in spite of our treatment, okay? You don't have to worry about numbers necessarily, but the blue line is the five-year mean. So again, when you ask, was this year a bad year or not? If you were out in the rice and it was, it's with respect to Culex tarsalis, it was a really bad year, okay? When you combine that with our disease surveillance, so all of these spots are <clears throat> locations where a sample was taken and uh, West Nile was detected. So uh, red dots are um, infected mosquito samples. Black dots are infected dead birds. And the white dots are where samples were taken, but they were negative, okay? Um, that's a lot. When you combine all that together, the abundance and the disease, um, uh, the disease incidence um, in something called vector index, this is for our rice field traps. So these are the same traps that you saw the abundance before. It's narrowed the, the risk time and there's, there's some differences in how to interpret this, but one way is to say any vector index that's over 500 means that there's a pretty good risk that someone's gonna get sick or there's gonna be some disease transmission. Okay. So the horizontal line is 500 above that and between the two green lines, that's really the, the hot time for public health risk. And fortunately, um, that's where all of our treatment occurs. So we really try to target in time and space where our treatments go to best manage that risk. Um, in the future, I would love to be able to run that before and then do something and watch that go down. Um, so that's something for later. Again, compared to our last really bad year, that's 2012. Um, again, it was a bad year, okay? So how do we deal with, um, and I'm getting to the end here and we'll take some questions. Um, how do we deal with it when we've done our very best to prevent and um, limit the, the larvae? Uh, we have some adult mosquitoes and they're flying around and wanting to bite people. So this is a very common, I think, mental image that I wanna kind of dispel and hopefully you can pass this on. On the left is what people think about <laughs> when they hear we're gonna spray for mosquitoes. It's this old, you know, kind of cool wood paneled truck with this massive cloud coming off the back. This is called a thermal fog. This is a picture from, I think, Florida from like 1944 or something like that. Um, the, the fog that comes out is basically um, characterizes droplets. We want 
certain number and size of droplets. Um, <clears throat> thermal fogs have a really wide variation of droplets, really big ones, really small ones. It looks really cool, but it doesn't do as good a job of, of killing mosquitoes because with a mosquito, you want, you know, you want to know that one droplet from this product has this amount of uh, pesticide, it hits that uh, mosquito and it dies. Okay, we're not quite to that level, but that's, our, that's what we're going for. So to the right, that's what it looks like today. So I've actually had news crews come out and say, can we spray, you know, film your, your truck fogging? And they're super disappointed because they want to see what's on the left, but I'm sorry, it's, it's what's on the right. Um, and it's a very, very low volume, so less than an ounce per acre. And we're shooting, for most products, it varies from product to product, about 30 microns uh, average drop size. And uh, we want as many of those as possible, okay? You take that to an aerial situation, um, it's basically the same thing. And here's some principles um, that a lot of people don't understand. When we do a mosquito adulticide application, we are creating a fog or a cloud of droplets that we are treating the space above wherever it is that we're treating. So say it's a rice field or a neighborhood, um, we're treating the area where the mosquitoes are. We don't want it to get on the plants or on the sidewalk or, you know, wherever. Um, we want it to stay up in the air column for enough time so that when those mosquitoes are flying through it, they get those droplets on them and they die. Okay, that's the goal. So it, it's, uh, it's completely different if you were trained as a, like an ag or a traditional application. It, this is the opposite of that whole thing. With an ag application, you want to keep everything down on the ground. It won't go, make it stick to the plants. Uh, you don't want any drift. Well, we're creating we don't use the D word in, in terms of this application, but we want to make a controlled cloud that, that goes through a target area when mosquitoes are most active. Okay? And we do that um, in a very specific way that I don't think any other pesticide application uses. Um, so this is an, the, the aircraft down below is, um, is a twin engine Cessna um, that we use for over um, populated areas. So uh, we need an uh, aircraft like that for populated areas. The little uh, brass missile looking thing on the right is a Ames 20 probe. This is a weather probe that basically collects wind and temperature and wind direction data on board the aircraft in real time. Uh, and the thing on the left is a, a Micronair uh, micro atomizer. This is the nozzle. So it, the fan blade is basically spinning as the plane's flying and it's spitting out a very consistent 30 micron droplet cloud, okay? All of that stuff is connected to a computer and uh, uh, there's a, a software model uh, based on some uh, forestry model that was uh, developed that basically will calculate based on the atmospheric conditions um, where this cloud is likely to go. So what we end up with, um, the questions we end up with is so, Last night, you said you're going to spray over in area X, but you're, I am over here in area Y, and the plane flew right over my head, so are you lying to me? Here's what happened. Down at, uh, focus on the lower left corner, there's that purple box. That is our target area, and the green stipples are the swaths. That's where the, uh, the model uh, puts the, the target of the cloud. The red and green lines just down and right of that is the flight path of the aircraft, okay? So they flew an offset. So they fly about around 300 feet above ground level release height. Um, they fly about 200 miles an hour as slow as the air airplane can go, uh, much under 200 than the airplane lands, whether it wants to or not. Um, and then the green is when the spray is on and the, and the red is where the spray is off. So they're using the wind that's gonna be coming out of the south um, east here to target that cloud going through that space where the mosquitoes are active. On the ground, um, and districts vary um, in their use of this, we use the thing in the, the lower right, which are cages which we put mosquitoes in, and we place them inside and outside that target area to assess what actually happened on the ground. Um, and uh, hopefully we get really good mortality in that spray block, and it, and it works. All right. I am a bit out of time and I apologize. I've mentioned some of these things uh, previously. Um, and I think I just want to uh, just impress on everyone um, that 
I think more communication with um, all of the various uh, pesticide application entities will be really helpful. And um, thank you very much for your time today. All right.